So let's go to question number 13. Question number 13 is asking, solution R, S, and T have pH values as shown. So as you can see in this, in this table, we have solution R, S, and T with the pH values being 1, 6.5, and 8, 40. So the first question is asking, what do you deduce about the nature of solution R? Or we can rephrase this. We can rephrase it like this. What is the nature of solution R? So the nature of solution R, we see that R has a pH of 1 in the pH scale. This is the pH scale because the pH scale ranges from 1 to 14. So pH scale is an indicator that helps us to know the acidity or the basicity of a substance. So in this case, we have R. We have been asked, what is the nature of solution R? R, we see that the pH is 1. So in the pH scale, we know that between 0 to 3, those are very strong acids. Between 4 to 6, those are weak acids. 7 is neutral, so that is a neutral solution. So apart from 7, the next one we have is from 8 to 13. So from 8 to, rather, from 8 to 11, we have weak bases. And then from 12 to 14, we have strong bases. So in this case, we have R. And R is pH 1. So pH 1, the nature of R is a strong acid. So that is the nature of R. It is a strong acid as uh, explained by the pH scale. So the next one we are being asked, identify two solutions that will react to form a neutral solution. So in this table, R, S, and T, identify two solutions that will react to form a neutral solution. So remember, uh, like earlier, the earlier questions, we defined a neutralization reaction. And we said neutralization reaction, this is a reaction whereby an acid reacts with a base. So if an acid reacts with a base, that type of reaction, we say that it's called a neutralization reaction. So why is it called a neutralization reaction? Because looking at the pH scale, we see 7 is the intermediate or 7 is in the middle of acid and base. So the acid is directly towards this side and the base is directly towards this side. So if both of them react, the pH tends to come at the center in that neutral region. So if those two react, they will tend to neutralize each other. And that's why it's called a neutralization reaction. So in this case, identify two solutions that will react to form a neutral solution. So the two that will react to form a neutral solution, obviously is an acid and a base. So in this case, remember R is an acid. And then also S is an acid. Seven, remember we say that it is neutral. So anything, uh, from 6.5 going towards 1, th those are acids. From 7.5 going towards 14, remember those are bases. So in this case, we have R which is 1 and T which is a base because it is 8. So if R reacts with T, we are going to get a salt and water that is neutralization. So the answers to this, we had R and T, whereby R is an acid, T is a base, and also we had S and T, whereby S, in, S is an acid and then obviously T, that is a base. So that were the answers to that. So let's look at the next number, which is question number 14. So question number 14 is asking, state and explain the changes in mass that occur when zinc metal is, is, is heated in an open crucible. So state what happens to, uh, to the change in mass for zinc if zinc is heated in an open crucible. So what is going to happen? The mass of the zinc is going to increase. Yeah, the mass of zinc is going to increase. So why is it that the mass of zinc is going to increase? So the mass of zinc will increase because heating zinc, it will force zinc to react with oxygen in the atmosphere. So zinc is going to react with oxygen in the atmosphere, forming zinc oxide. Like you can see, so zinc is reacting with oxygen to form zinc oxide. So let's assume the mass of zinc is 5. Let's assume the mass of oxygen is 2. They have formed zinc oxide. So the mass of zinc plus the mass of oxygen, we are going to get a mass of 7. This is just an example so that we can understand the numbers. 
So the mass will be 7. So it means that zinc has reacted with oxygen to form an even heavier compound, which is zinc oxide. So if zinc is heated in oxygen, it will react it will react with the oxygen to form a compound which is zinc oxide and therefore you see that zinc oxide is very dense. So state and explain the change in mass that occurs when zinc metal is heated in open crucible. If it's heated in open crucible, obviously there is oxygen in, the, in that open crucible. Therefore zinc will react with oxygen to form zinc oxide whereby zinc oxide will be denser than the zinc that uh, that was there before and oxygen that was there before so what is a crucible what is this apparatus referred to as a crucible what is an apparatus so this term apparatus means that these are the equipments used in the laboratory to carry out experiments i didn't i did not say lab if you say lab in an exam you will get it wrong so there is nothing in chemistry like lab. There is only laboratory. So if I've been asked to define an apparatus, you should never say that these are equipments used in the lab. Because of that lab, you'll get everything wrong. So you should say that these are the equipments used in the laboratory to carry out experiments. That is an apparatus. So in this case, we have been given this apparatus, which is a crucible. What is a crucible? So a crucible, as you can see, this is an apparatus that is used to strongly heat substances or to strongly heat solid substances. It's an apparatus that is used to strongly heat solid substances. It's referred to as a crucible. Yes, that is that. So, question number 15 is asking, the pH of soil sample was found to be 6.0. That is the pH. Remember the pH scale in the previous question? We say that 7 going uh, on the lower side those are acids so it means that this is an acid so the ph of soil sample was found to be 6.0 an agricultural officer recommended the addition of lime lime is always calcium uh, calcium oxide so state two functions of lime in the soil so what are the functions of lime remember lime is basic in nature it is basic in nature so in this case, the pH of the soil was found to be 6. 6 means that the pH of the soil is acidic. So the soil is acidic. In this case, an agricultural officer recommended the addition of lime. Lime is basic. Lime is always basic. So this reaction between an acid and a base, remember we say that it is called a neutralization reaction. So the pH of the soil sample was found to be 6.0. An agricultural officer recommended the addition of lime, which is calcium oxide. So state two functions of lime in the soil. Why did the agricultural officer advise the farmer to add lime? So state two functions of the lime in the soil. So the first function of the lime was to neutralize the acidity nature of the soil. That's the first function. Because the soil is acidic, we are adding base. It will neutralize. That's the first function. So the second function is to add nutrients. So lime is to add nutrients to the soil. It acts as a fertilizer. So it's going to also add nutrients to the soil. And those were the two functions of adding the lime to the soil. So the first function was to neutralize the acidity or the acidic nature of the soil and also to add nutrients to the soil. So we are in question number 16 and it's asking, using dots and crosses to represent, uh, use dots and crosses rather, to represent the outermost electrons of the below compounds. So the below compound, we see that we have been given magnesium sulfide. We have been given magnesium sulfide. So we have been asked, use dots and crosses to represent the bond or bonding to show the bonding in magnesium sulfide. So in this case, we know that magnesium, so magnesium is a metal, and then sulfide from the word sulfur is a non-metal. So the atomic number of magnesium is 12. The electronic configuration of magnesium is 282. So let's look at sulfur. The atomic number of sulfur is always 16. The electronic configuration of sulfur is always 2. Uh, 8, 6. Yeah, it's 2, 8, 6. So since magnesium 
loses two electrons to be stable, it is automatically it automatically becomes a metal. And since sulfur gains two electrons in order to be stable, it automatically becomes a non-metal. So remember, we say that metals react by losing electrons. Non-metals react by gaining electrons. So, and that's why you have this bond which is magnesium sulfide. So, what type of bond did we say is formed between metals and non-metals? We say that the bond is ionic bond. So, ionic bond is the bond formed between metals and the non-metals. That is the bond. If you have been asked the structure formed between magnesium uh, and sulfur in magnesium sulfide, we say that the structure is giant ionic structure. So the structure is giant ionic structure. If you have been asked the bond, the bond is ionic bond. So in this case, we are dealing with the magnesium sulfide. Magnesium sulfide is written as MgS. So we are going to show the bond for MgS. That is the chemical symbol of the compound. It's MgS. So uh, we know that the atomic number of magnesium is 12 and then configuration is 2H2 as you can see of sulfur is 16 and then configuration is 286 as you can see so you must we must have these basics in order to show the bonding if you don't know these basics you cannot show the bonding so it's a must for you to know the atomic number the electronic configuration it's going to lose how many it's going to gain how many for you to show the bonding so for us to show the bonding for ionic bond we must have brackets so remember for covalent bonds we are using only the circle and the circles inter or joining each other but for the ionic bond you must represent it with the brackets as you can see so that is the bonding for magnesium sulfide and then uh, like apart from drawing that as far as drawing that so you must show this first element it is losing how many and then you must show also the other one it is gaining how many that must be there if that is not there you get it wrong so you must show that this uh, this bracket this element has lost two the other one has gained two and also apart from gaining two in the gaining two you must show if this one was x in the other one in the sulfur you must show those two electrons that have been gained so you must show their x and x in the sulfur for you to complete the uh, to complete the question and to get it correctly so question letter B in 16, we have been asked, state the structure of the above compound. So you have said that the structure is giant ionic structure. The bond is ionic bond, but the structure is giant ionic structure. So rem always remember that. And then we go to question C. So C is asking, give two properties of substances with the above structure. So... If you didn't get it correct in B, it will be very hard for you to get it in C. So this question is asking, give two properties of substances or characteristics. Give two characteristics of substances with the above structure in B. So the above structure in B, remember you say this giant ionic structure. So what are the characteristics of giant ionic structure? We see that the ionic structures, they have a very high melting and boiling point. That's the first one. So the second, the second property or characteristic, we see that the ionic structures, uh, they conduct electricity only in liquid or aqueous or molten state and not in solid state. So they conduct electricity in liquid, aqueous or molten state, but not in solid state. For example, the table salt at home. The table salt does not conduct electricity in solid state. But if you dissolve it in water, it will conduct electricity. So the other one is that ionic structure, they form crystals. Like for example, you see the salt at home, that is a crystal. Example, you see magnesium chloride, we have calcium hydroxide, we have calcium chloride. Uh, we also have calcium sulfate, which is blue in color. We also have the sugar. The sugar at home is an example of an ionic structure. Also, we see that they are very hard and brittle. It is very hard for you to cut ionic structure. Ionic structure. Let's say, for example, you take that salt uh, from the, yeah, from the salt just at home. You take that crystal and try to cut it. So you, you'll notice that it is not as easy 
to cut as maybe as how you'll want to cut anything else. So they are very hard and brittle. Brittle, it means that they look like glass. They mostly look like glass in nature. So also we, ha we see that they have a very high uh, enthalpy heat of fusion and enthalpy heat of vaporization. So it is also very high for ionic structure and also they are good insulators. So ionic structures are very good insulators. So let's go to question number 17. So question number 17 is asking, in an experiment, a test tube full of chlorine water was inverted in chlorine water as shown in the diagram. So as you can see, uh, this is what the question is talking about. We have been asked that in an experiment, a test tube full of chlorine water was inverted in chlorine, a full of chlorine rather, was inverted in chlorine water as shown in the diagram and set up in sunlight for one day. So remember, we are here there is sunlight. <laughs> so remember the sunlight. And in the previous questions, we dealt with this question. And we saw that if there is sunlight, therefore there will be hypochlorous acid which will be decomposed. But let's continue. So after one day, a gas was found to have collected in the test tube. So after one day, in that test tube, there was some gas found on top of that test tube. So the first question is asking, identify the gas. The gas, we say that it is oxygen gas. So let's try to reverse engineer this, uh, this equation or this question we see. So if you reverse engineer this question, we'll see that when chlorine reacts with water, yeah, if chlorine reacts with water, we are going to obtain two acids. So the first acid we are going to obtain is hydrochloric acid, and then we are going to also obtain hypochlorous acid. So HCl plus HOCl. That is chlorine reacting with water. We're going to get uh, hydrochloric acid and hypochlorous acid. Therefore, remember I said that we have sunlight. So sunlight is going to decompose the hypochlorous acid because hypochlorous acid is very unstable. So sunlight is going to decompose the hypochlorous acid to hydrochloric acid and oxygen. So that is where we are obtaining the oxygen from from the decomposition of hypochlorous acid to hydrochloric acid and oxygen. So that is where we are obtaining the oxygen from. So identify the gas, the gas is oxygen. So the next question which is B is asking, state the observations made when a blue litmus paper is dipped in chlorine water. So if the blue litmus paper is dipped in chlorine water, what is going to take place? So remember we say that the non-metallic oxide, they react with water to form acidic solution. So if we take a blue litmus paper and dip it in chlorine water, the blue litmus paper is going to turn color from blue to red. Remember, I did not say the, the blue litmus paper will change to red. Or I didn't say the litmus paper will change to red. I identified the colors. So the blue litmus paper is going to change color from blue to red color. So that is the best way to answer that question. You don't leave it there because something else is going to take place. So the blue litmus paper will change color from blue to red and then from red to white in color. So that is the complete answer. So why is it that it's going to change color from blue to red and then to white? It is because the chlorine water, which is the hypochlorous acid, is going to bleach the litmus paper from red to color white. So it's going to bleach the litmus paper. The litmus paper will be bleached. Like for example, you see at home we have jic, we have topex, and we have all those bleaching agents. So that is how the bleaching agents work. So these bleaching agents, they use the hypochlorous acid to remove the stains and the dye from fabric. And that is why it is advisable when soaking your clothes, you should never leave those clothes in open sunlight. Uh, most people, they cover the, the basin with another basin in order to prevent direct sunlight. It's because if you leave those clothes or that water in open sunlight, so sunlight is going to decompose the hypochlorous acid to hydrochloric acid and oxygen. So the oxygen in this case is always the one responsible for removing the dye from the fabric. So in this case, the litmus paper is going to change color from uh, the blue litmus will change color from blue to red and then it will bleach. It will bleach meaning that the oxygen in hypochlorous acid is the one that will be responsible 
for removing the dye from the, from the litmus paper. So let's go to the next question, which is question number 18. So the question number 18 is asking, the, element, the elements shown in the table below belong to a certain family of metals in the periodic table. So study the information and answer the questions that follow. So remember the chemical families in the periodic table. What did we see? We have, we say that we have the alkali metals belonging to group one elements. We have alkaline earth metals belonging to group two elements. We have uh, metalloids or we have charcoals belonging to group four elements. We had halogens or salt producers belonging to group seven elements. And then finally, we had halogens, so halogens, uh, rather not halogens, but we had noble gases or inert gases or rare gases, which are group eight elements. So this question is asking about chemical families. Study the information and answer the questions that follow. So define the term ionization energy. What is the ionization energy? Ionization energy, this is the minimum energy required to remove an electron from the outermost energy level. That is the ionization energy. And we enter ahead and say that, for example, take a look at sodium. We have sodium, whereby sodium loses only one electron. So sodium will only have one ionization energy because it loses only one electron. Let's look at, let's contrast with the magnesium. Magnesium loses two electrons in order to become stable. Therefore, magnesium will not have two ionization energy. No, it will have the first ionization energy and the second ionization energy. Remember, magnesium, I didn't say it has two ionization energy. Generally, you'll say it has two. But to look at it specifically, we'll say that magnesium has the first ionization energy to lose the first electron and then the second ionization energy to lose the second electron. So magnesium has the first and the second ionization energy. Let's look at aluminium as number 13. Aluminium loses three electrons in order to become stable. So aluminium has the first ionization energy, the second ionization energy, and lastly, the third ionization energy. And for aluminium, we see that the third ionization energy is always larger than the first ionization energy. The same as magnesium. The second ionization energy is always larger than the first ionization energy. So this question is asking, define the term ionization energy. You say that this is the minimum energy required to remove an electron from the outermost energy level of an element in its gaseous state. That is the uh, definition of ionization energy. And you should know the opposite of ionization energy is electron affinity. So that's the opposite. Ionization energy, remember you say that this is the, uh, the minimum energy required to lose electron. Electron affinity, this is the minimum energy required to gain electrons from the outermost energy level of an element in its gaseous state. So the opposite of ionization energy is always electron affinity. So the next question is asking, which element is likely to have the highest ionization energy? Explain. So which element has the highest ionization energy? As you can see, we have element S, T, and V. Let's look at the atomic size. See, the atomic size of S is 0 0.160. For T is 0 0.180. For V is 0 0.930. So which one has the highest ionization energy? So the smaller the atom, the higher the ionization energy. Or the smaller the atomic radius, this atomic size, the smaller the atomic size, the higher the ionization energy. Therefore, element S has the highest ionization energy. Why? Because the outermost, the outermost energy level or the outermost electrons are very close to the nucleus. Since they are very close to the nucleus, it will require a very large amount of energy to remove an electron from the outermost energy level. Since a lot of energy will be required to remove the outermost energy level, it will mean that the ionization energy must be very high in order to remove the electrons. Therefore, since S is a very small atom, it will have very high ionization energy. Since V, it's a very large atom. Yeah, since V is a very large atom, it will require very low energy.
to remove the outermost electron from the outermost energy level. So our answer here is S as the answer because it is a very small atom. That is the answer. So question number 19 is asking, state two applications of solvent extraction. So solvent extraction is a method of, is a method of extraction uh, whereby we looked at the different methods of extraction whereby we saw we, we had fractional distillation, filtration, evaporation, etc. So solvent extraction is another method of extraction. So this question is asking state two applications or uses. It is also uses. So state two applications or uses of solvent extraction. So the first one, we can see that solvent extraction can be used to extract different medicines from plants. So solvent extraction can be used to extract different herbal medicines from plants. So also solvent extraction can be used to extract natural dyes from the plant. Example from the flowers. So it can be used also to extract the dyes, the different colors or the different dyes from the plants. Also, solvent extraction can be used to extract caffeine from tea or coffee. So it can be used to extract caffeine from tea or coffee. It can also be used to extract oil from nuts. It can also be used uh, to remove dyes from fabric. Yeah, so it can also be used to remove the different types of dyes from fabric. Because the, uh, the method of, uh, that we said that we are using um, hypochlorous acid can also fall under solvent extraction. So whereby we are using the hypochlorous acid to remove the dye from fabric. So that is another application of solvent extraction, removal of dye from fabric. So far so good. Let's go to question number 20. So question number 20 is asking, so this is a diagram of aluminum trichloride of, uh, yeah, it's an aluminum trichloride. If you condense the, the compound, you will get aluminum trichloride. So we have two bonds. So the question is asking, the diagram below represents the structure of al aluminum trichloride. So identify the bonds labeled M and N. So it's an dialuminium hexachloride. That's the, the name for Al2Cl6. Dialuminium hexachloride. And I said you can compress it to only aluminium trichloride, AlCl3. So the diagram below represents the structure of dialuminium hexachloride. So identify the bonds labeled M and N. So what are these bonds? So first of all, we see we have bond labeled M. Bond labeled M that is a covalent bond. Bond labeled N, that is a dative or a coordinate bond. If you can look at this compound, it's an aluminium reacting with chlorine. Aluminium, what's the nature of aluminium? Aluminium is a metal. Chlorine, what's the nature of chlorine? Chlorine is a non-metal. So we see that they form a bond which is not an ionic bond. This bond is a covalent bond. Why is it that aluminium reacts with chlorine to form a covalent bond? Why is it not an ionic bond? Because earlier on you said that when metals react with non-metals, they form an ionic bond and they form a giant ionic structure. But in this case we see that aluminium is reacting with chlorine. This reaction, they form a covalent bond and not an ionic bond. What is the reason? So we see that in the periodic table, this aluminium element it's, it reacts in a very special way as compared to all the other metals in the periodic table. That is the 20 elements of the periodic table to be specific. So this aluminum, we see that it reacts by losing electrons. So since it reacts by losing electrons, it forms a very small atom. So since it forms a very small atom, that small atom reacts with other non-metals to form covalent bonds and not ionic bonds. So the answer is that since aluminium reacts by losing electrons, it becomes, it therefore becomes a very small or a very tiny atom. Since it becomes a very tiny atom, it reacts with now the non-metals or different non-metals to instead form covalent bonds apart from forming ionic bond. And that's why aluminium is a very special atom. It reacts with the non-metals to form covalent bonds and not ionic bonds. So bond labeled M 
is a covalent bond and not ionic bond. It's a covalent bond. So the bond labeled N, that is a, uh, that is a dative bond. A dative bond or a coordinate bond. So dative bond, what did you define dative bond or coordinate bond is? We say that the dative bond, this is a special type of bond uh, uh, formed uh, like whereby one atom donates two electrons to be shared. For covalent bond, both atoms donate equal electrons to be shared. But for the dative bond, one atom is going to donate two electrons. So this other atom is going to be a spectator atom, but one is going to donate two electrons to form the chemical bond. And as well, again, we went through this and we say that you, may, you might be asked in an exam, explain why a coordinate bond is a special type of covalent bond. So the answer to, uh, the answer to that will say that it is a special type of covalent bond because in covalent bond, both atom donates equal amount of uh, electrons to be shared. But, but in coordinate bond, it's only one atom that donates two electrons to be shared. So the other one remains to be a spectator ions. One donates two electrons to be shared. So that is that. So letter B is asking, what is the difference between bond M and bond N? That is just what we have just gone through. Bond M is a covalent bond because both atom donates two electrons or both atom donates equal amount of electrons to be shared while bond N is a coordinate bond whereby it is only chlorine that arrow points where electrons are going. It is only chlorine that has donated two electrons to be shared. So in the coordinate bond, remember, that arrow shows the direction whereby electrons are going. So since the arrow points away from chlorine, it means that the electrons are coming from chlorine going towards the aluminum. So it is chlorine that has donated two electrons to be shared. So let's go to the next number, which is question number 21. So question number 21 is asking, from the following list of compounds, we have zinc oxide, we have potassium carbonate, we have solid carbon 4 oxide, we have nitric acid and ion 3 chloride and sodium chloride. So from these compounds that you can see here, so identify two substances that sublime. Identify two substances that sublime. So the first substance that sublime is solid carbon 4 oxide. So remember, I did not say it is carbon 4 oxide. If you only say it is carbon dioxide, you are going to get it wrong. So you must specify and say it is solid carbon four oxide. So the answer is not carbon four oxide, but must be solid carbon four oxide. Remember, carbon four oxide gas does not sublime. It is a gas. So you must be specific and say that it is solid carbon four oxide. So that's the answer. So the other one is ion 3 chloride. So ion 3 chloride also sublimes. Remember we, we looked at the different chlorides that sublime. We say that we had ion 3 chloride, we had cobalt 2 chloride, and also we had uh, phosphorus 5 chloride. Mm. Yeah, we had phosphorus 5 chloride. Those were the chlorides that we identified, they sublime. Apart from that, we had benzoic acid also sublimes. We had iodine. It also sublimes. And we also had naphthalene. Those are the substances that, that sublime. So the next question, Roman 2 is asking, identify two substances that react to form salt and water only. So the substances reacting to form salt and water only, here we must react what? An acid and a base. So remember the general equations that we formed. So if an acid reacts with a metal, if an acid reacts with a metal, we form salt plus hydrogen gas. If an acid reacts with a base, we get salt plus water. If an acid reacts with a metal carbonate, we are going to get salt plus water. But since it is a carbonate, we are going to add carbon four oxide, as you can see. So if an acid reacts with a metal hydrogen carbonate, we are going to get salt plus water. Yes, because it's a base, we are going to get salt and water as the base. And then, since it, there is a carbonate, we must get also carbon for oxide. So remember these four general formula. 
So in this case, you are being asked, identify two substances that react to form salt and water only. So these two substances, we must react a base and an acid. So in this case, we have, uh, we have nitric acid. It's the first acid we have identified. So we have nitric acid and we also have zinc oxide. So if nitric acid reacts with zinc oxide, we are going to get zinc nitrate and also we are going to get water. So zinc nitrate being the salt and water being the water. So that is the answer. So let's go to question number 22. So question number 22 is asking, the figure below is a setup, uh, the figure below is a setup to investigate the reaction of calcium with water. So calcium is reacting with water in this case. So as you can see, this is the diagram whereby we have gas, let us see, we have water, and then we have calcium metal. So state the observations made in the water. So the observations made in the water will be, there'll be some formation of white suspension in the water. Why? Yeah, so there'll be some formation of white suspension of water, implying that the atmosphere, or rather, the, yeah, the atmosphere has some traces of carbon for oxide. So you see that calcium hydroxide, calcium is going to react with water to form calcium hydroxide. If you leave that calcium hydroxide left in the atmosphere, it is going to react with carbon four oxide to form calcium carbonate. Now this calcium carbonate or calcium hydrogen carbonate, if the carbonate, if the carbon four oxide is excess in the atmosphere, is the one that is going to change the color of the, the colorless solution inside the beaker or inside the trough from colorless to white. So still the observations made in the water. There will be some formation of white suspension. So identify gas C. So gas C, it is always hydrogen gas. Why is it hydrogen gas? As you can look at this equation, when metals react with water, they form metal hydroxide plus hydrogen gas. Like as you can see in this equation. So calcium metal reacted with water. So if calcium metal reacts with water, we are going to get calcium hydroxide plus hydrogen gas. Therefore, gas C is always hydrogen gas because it is a metal reacting with water to get a metal hydroxide plus hydrogen gas. So that is that. So let us see is asking state one laboratory application of the solution formed in the reaction. In this case, what's the solution? The solution is calcium hydroxide. Let's look at the equation again. So the equation we are reacting calcium plus water. If we react calcium plus water, we are going to get calcium hydroxide plus hydrogen gas. So that is what we are going to obtain. Calcium hydroxide plus hydrogen gas. So in this case, the solution is calcium hydroxide. Now, this calcium hydroxide, if it reacts with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we're going to get calcium carbonate plus water molecules. If the carbon dioxide is excess in the atmosphere, therefore we're going to get calcium hydrogen carbonate. But the question is asking, state one laboratory application of the solution formed in the reaction. So the solution formed, calcium reacting with water, we get calcium hydroxide. So what is the application of calcium hydroxide? Calcium hydroxide, it is used in the laboratory to test for the presence of carbon four oxide in the atmosphere. That is the only function. So the only function of calcium hydroxide here that can be used in the laboratory it's that it is used to test for the presence of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And that is that. So question number 23 is asking, state two types of salts based on nature and two types of salts based on composition. So state two types of salts based on nature and two types of salts based on composition. So let's first of all look at the two types of salts based on composition. So this composition, what does it mean? So the salts based on composition, it's what is making up that salt. So the elements present inside that salt, that is what it means by composition. So the salts based on composition, so the first one we have, we have acid salts. Apart from that, remember we said that we had from acid, we have basic salts. After basic salts, we have normal salts. After normal salts, finally we have double salts. So those are the salts based on composition, meaning that 
what is inside those so the elements that make up that salt based on composition so the next one we have salts based on the nature so the nature means how they behave in the atmosphere so remember we have salts based on composition what elements make up that salt and then we also have salts based on the nature so how that salt behaves in the atmosphere so the salts based on nature first of all we have a fluorescent salt uh, let's start from the deliquescent salts so we have deliquescent salts what are deliquescent salts so these are the salts that when left exposed to the atmosphere they absorb water and form solutions those are deliquescent salts Apart from that, the other salt based on nature, we have hygroscopic salts. So, what are hygroscopic salts? These are salts, when left in the atmosphere, they absorb water from the environment, but form damp substances, or they form damp salts. So, remember, for deliquescent, they absorb water and form solutions. For, the, uh, for hygroscopic salts, they absorb water, but only form damp solid substances. Then lastly, the salt based on nature, we have a fluorescent salt. So a fluorescent salt, these are the salts that when left exposed to the atmosphere, they will lose water into the surrounding. Or we can say they will lose water of crystallization into the surrounding. So for the deliquescent salt and hygroscopic salt, they all absorb water. For a fluorescent salt, they lose water to the atmosphere. So we have those types of salts based on composition, normal salt, acid salt, not acidic salt. Don't say acidic salt. It is acid salt. So the acid salt, they have, they have hydrogen ions inside them. For example, we have sodium, hydrogen, carbonate. We have magnesium, hydrogen, carbonate. So since they have that hydrogen, that hydrogen plays a very important role in making those salts behave like acids, even though they are they, they are basic salt. So if you react these salts, yes, they are basic. They'll react like a base. But some traces of that salt, they are going to behave like acid because of that hydrogen. So that's why they are called acid salts. Apart from that, we have basic salts because of the OH. And then we have the double salt. And then salts based on nature, we have the liquid salt. They absorb to form solution. We have hygroscopic salt. They absorb water to form damp solid substances. We have a fluorescent salt which lose water into the surrounding. So that is that. So Roman II is asking, name the following processes. When anhydrous calcium chloride is left in an open beaker overnight, some days it turns into powder. So when anhydrous calcium chloride, anhydrous calcium chloride is left in an open beaker overnight, uh, a solution is formed. So what uh, like what does it mean by anhydrous? Anhydrous salt, this is a salt that doesn't have water of crystallization. Hydrated salt, this is a salt that has water of crystallization. In this case, we are being asked, anhydrous calcium chloride is left in an open beaker overnight. In the morning, you will find that it formed a solution. So it formed a solution. So it means that this salt was left in the atmosphere being dry in the morning we came and looked at that salt, so it had formed a solution. So what is the name of that process? So, this process is referred to as deliquescence. So, as you can see, the process has been underlined, the process has been set into bold, the process has been done everything. Because the question is specific. <laughs> the question is asking about the process. If it's the process they are asking for, the process is deliquescence. So the type of salt is a deliquescent salt, but the process is deliquescence. So you must take note of that. So the process is deliquescence. So the next one, the next which is uh, B is asking, when sodium carbonate decahydrate crystals are left open, uh, are left in an open beaker for some days, it turned into powder. So decahydrate means that deca. What's the meaning of deca? Deca means 10. Decahydrate, 10 molecules of water. That is decahydrate. For example, if you have been told, pentahydrate, penta, penta means five. So five molecules of water. Hexahydrate, hexa means six molecules of water. Heptahydrate, hepta means seven molecules of water. Octahydrate, octa means 
eight molecules of water. Nonahydrate. Nona means nine. And then in this case, we are being told that it is sodium carbonate decahydrate, meaning that it is sodium carbonate but has 10 molecules of water. So we're going to write Na2CO3.10H2O to represent that it's sodium, uh, sodium carbonate, but it is hydrated. It has 10 molecules of water. Going back to the question, when sodium carbonate decahydrate crystals are left in an open beaker for some days, it turns into powder. So the sodium carbonate was hydrated, it was left in the atmosphere, it lost water of crystallization. So it turned into powder. So what is the process, the name of the process? The process is efflorescence. So that is the name of the process. The process is efflorescence. So remember, the type of salt is which type of salt? Based on nature, it is an efflorescent salt. That's an efflorescent salt. But what is the process name? So the process name is efflorescence. So that is the process name. So let's go to question number 24. What is question number 24 asking? So it is asking, the following diagram shows the structure of two allotropes of carbon. So study them and answer the questions that follow. So we have the two allotropes of carbon. So the allotropes, you know, the allotropes of carbon, we have soot, we have graphite, we have diamond, we have amorphous carbon, and also we have furelin. That is fullerene. So we also have that kafuleri over there. So name the allotrope D and E. So as you can see, name these two allotropes, allotrope D and allotrope E. So what's the name given to allotrope D? That is always the structure of graphite. That is always the structure of graphite, whereby for the structure of graphite, we see that it is only for each carbon, it is only three electrons that are used to form that structure. It is only three because each dot over there, you see that it is bonded to three bonds. One, two, three, one, two, three. So the valency of carbon, the atomic number of carbon is six. The electronic configuration of carbon is two and then two, four. So it means that the valency of carbon is positive or negative four. That is a metalloid or uh, it's found in the family of charcoals. It is a metalloid. Why is it called a metalloid? It's called a metalloid because... It can either lose four electrons to be stable, to behave like metals, or it can gain four electrons to be stable and behave like non-metals. So that is why it is called a metalloid. It is exactly found in the intermediate of the eight maximum electrons of the outermost energy level of the second energy level. So that's why it can behave as non-metals, lose four, or it can behave as uh, non-metals, gain four, or metals, lose four. Four. For the graphite, we see that it is each carbon atom, that is those dots that you can see, each carbon atom is only using three electrons apart from four. So it means that one electron has been left to freely roam around graphite. And that's by the, the reason why graphite conducts electricity. That's the reason. So element D is graphite. Element E is diamond. So that is always the structure of diamond so diamond those bonds those dark lines those dark lines are always called the strong covalent bonds the strong covalent bonds of diamond they are the ones responsible for making diamond a very strong metal why because diamond is the bonds in the diamond or rather the carbon atoms in diamond they are held together by strong covalent bonds for graphite those dotted lines, those are uh, weak van der Waals forces. So graphite atoms of carbon, they are held together by weak van der Waals forces. And that's why you can write with graphite. Graphite can conduct electricity, etc. For diamond, it is a very strong metal because the carbon atoms are joined together by very strong covalent bonds. So let's go to question B. It's asking... Which allotrope does not conduct electricity between D and E? Which one does not conduct electricity? Explain. So the allotrope that does not conduct electricity in these two is diamond, allotrope letter E. Why is it that allotrope letter E does not conduct electricity? 
So a lot of letter E does not conduct electricity because it uses all the electrons to form, uh, to form the bond. So let's continue to question number 25. So question number 25 is asking that ion 3 chloride can be prepared in the laboratory by passing dry chlorine gas over hot steel wool. So remember this question is asking that we are reacting ion with chlorine gas. So if we react an, a metal with a non-metal in chemistry preparation of salts, so that process is always referred as direct synthesis, whereby we are reacting a metal directly with the non-metal to prepare the salt. So the question is saying that ion 3 chloride can be prepared in the laboratory by passing dry chlorine gas over hot steel iron, or rather hot steel wool. So steel wool is just the normal steel wool that you use at home to clean the sulfurias, to clean the utensils. So we are passing chlorine gas over that substance. So letter A is asking, so name the above method of preparing salt. So this method, as we had said, it is direct synthesis whereby, direct synthesis this is the method whereby we are reacting a metal and a non-metal in order to prepare a salt. So let's go to question number B. So question number B is asking, why should we prepare the salt in dry environment? So you should prepare the salt in dry environment because this ion 3 chloride is water loving, meaning that it readily absorbs water in the atmosphere forming compounds. So you should prepare it in dry environment in order to avoid the ion 3 chloride that will be formed to absorb the moisture in the atmosphere. So question C is asking, so a solution of ion 3 chloride in water changes blue litmus paper to red. Explain. So a solution of ion 3 chloride changes a blue litmus paper to red when dissolved in water. So as you can look at this equation, we are reacting ion 3 chloride with, uh, with water. So if we react ion 3 chloride with water, we are going to get ion 2 hydroxide and hydrochloric acid. Now this hydrochloric acid is the one responsible for changing the blue litmus paper from blue to red in color, thereby the pH of the solution being acidic. The HCl is the one responsible for doing that. So a solution of ion 3 chloride in water changes blue litmus paper to red, explain. So if we dissolve ion 3 chloride in water, we're going to get ion 3 hydroxide, yes it's ion 3 hydroxide plus hydrochloric acid in aqueous form. So the hydrochloric acid in aqueous form is the one responsible for changing the blue litmus paper from blue to red in color. So question number 27 is asking, so the figure below represents a setup that was used to demonstrate the existence of component of air. So as you can look at the, that's the setup, then the first question is asking, what is the purpose of water uh, from the tap. So what's the purpose of water from the tap? So the purpose of water from the tap is just to push the air through the calcium hydroxide. So that's the purpose of water. If we pump water, it's going to push the calcium hydroxide. We didn't use the air from the laboratory because maybe it had other impurities. So we are using water in order for the water now to push the air through the calcium hydroxide solution. So other than the bubbles, give the other observation made in the test tube. So uh, we saw bubbles, so the other observation made in the test tube is that the, the calcium hydroxide changed color from colorless to a white precipitate. So the calcium hydroxide formed a white precipitate implying that the air that was entering uh, had some traces of carbon four oxide. So remember the previous questions we discussed and said that anytime you see bubbles or anytime you see gas being passed through calcium hydroxide, we are testing for the presence of carbon four oxide. So in this case, we'll say that calcium hydroxide changed color from colorless to white in color or formed a white precipitate, implying that carbon four oxide was present. So the observation is that calcium hydroxide changed color from colorless to a white precipitate. So name a gas that was not absorbed by calcium hydroxide. So this calcium hydroxide only in air only absorbs carbon four oxide. So calcium hydroxide in air only absorbs uh, carbon four oxide. So the other gases in the component of air, the other gases not absorbed by calcium hydroxide, we have oxygen, we have nitrogen, 
we have inert gases. So these gases were not absorbed by calcium hydroxide. But it's only carbon dioxide that was absorbed by the calcium hydroxide forming a white precipitate of calcium carbonate. So the next question is asking. So the grid below is part of the periodic table. And the last question, this is the last question. So grid below is part of the periodic table. So study it and answer the questions that follow. As you can see, obviously the letters don't represent the actual symbols. So we have been given the grid with the letters jumbled up on the grid. So the letters don't represent the actual symbol. We have letter A to letter K and H ETC. So the first question is asking, element A fits in two groups. Element A, it fits in two groups. Uh, whereby you can see A is there in group number alkali metals and it's also there in the halogens. So explain, why is it that A can fit in both groups? So A can fit in both groups because we see that A can either lose one electron to be stable. If it loses one electron, it will be in alkali metals. So alkali metals, they lose electrons in order to be stable. Or A, it can be placed in halogens in group number seven. Because A, since uh, it can either lose one electron or gain one electron, it can also fit in halogens group. Uh, if it will lose that one electron, it can fit in the halogens group. If it will gain one electron, it will fit in the alkali metals group, that is group number one. So the answer is that A can either lose one electron to fit in alkali metal or gain one electron to fit in the halogen, the halogen group. So B is asking, name two elements that can form ions with a charge of negative one. Explain your answer. So name two elements that can form ions with a charge of negative one. So this is automatically elements in group number seven. Elements in group number seven, their charge is always negative one, meaning that they can, they can only gain one electron in order to become stable. So the elements, we have element A, E, and H. So they form compounds with the charge of negative one or they form ions with the charge of negative one. So how does the reactivity of H and E compare? So they are all in group seven elements. These are all non-metals. So how does the reactivity of E and H compare? So you see that E will be more reactive than H. So for the, non for the metals, remember, the larger the atomic radius for the metals, the higher the reactivity of that metal. So for example, like if a metal has a very small, uh, the atomic radius is very small, and uh, the other metal, the atomic radius is very large, so the one which has very large atomic radius will be the most reactive. For the nonmetals, it's directly opposite. So the nonmetal that has the smallest atomic radius, that is the most reactive, and the one that has the largest atomic radius, that is the, the least reactive. This is because the nonmetals uh, react by gaining electrons. So uh, like as the nonmetals are the smaller, the atomic radius for the nonmetals, the, the faster it will gain electrons. Yeah, the faster it will gain electrons in order to become stable. So the larger the atomic radius for the nonmetals, the slower it will gain electrons in the outermost energy level in order to become stable. In this case, we see that E has a very small atomic radius as compared to H. That will mean that E will be more reactive since it has a very small atomic radius as compared to H. So let's go to question letter D is asking, what name is given to the group of elements whereby C and D belong? So C and D belong to, that group is referred, group two. Group two is referred to as alkaline earth metals. So those are alkaline earth metals. So write the formula of the compound formed when C and F react. So if we react C from group two and F from group number six, we are going to get CF. So the formula, it's only, the formula of compound is only CF. So lastly, draw dots and cross to represent a compound formed in E above. So draw using dots and crosses, show the bonding form between C and F. So remember, C is a metal. So C is a metal and then F is a non-metal. So this type of bond that is being shown here, so this type of bond is referred to as ionic bond. So 
and that bond is referred to as ionic bond whereby we must use brackets to show ionic bond.